Tuesday webinar series. Uh, today's webinar is titled ABEs of Valve Automation. I'm Jerry Connolly with Seward Equipment Company. Just a couple of housekeeping items before we begin, please. Uh, during the presentation, five multiple choice questions to answer by poll vote. You'll click on the answer you think is correct. We'll post the results and then we'll move on to the next slide. This is very important to receive your operator and or PE credits for this webinar. You have to complete the poll questions during the presentations. If you run into technical problems with answering the poll questions, we have had a couple of snafus in the past. My apologies. Number one, try to not maximize your screen. And two, if that doesn't work, just write down your answers, email to Sherry, or send her, send the answers in the um, in the um, chat box or the questions box on your uh, GoToWebinar uh, poll, and we'll make sure we log all your answers. Uh, please feel free to type in any questions that you have in that questions drop-down arrow, and we'll do we'll. Sherry and I will keep a, an eye on them and we'll feed any answers to that we can't answer. We'll feed any of those answers to Jim at the end of the uh, presentation. So he'll answer any technical questions at the end. To receive your PE credit or your operator credit, you have to complete the evaluation that shows up at the end. So please stay connected until you complete the evaluation. You'll also need to download the certificate of completion and uh, and this is a PDF, and they can, you can download it pretty much any time throughout the presentation. Um, if you if you miss downloading these, same thing. Just get a hold of Sherry, and she'll get you one over to or get one over to you. Uh, as a reminder, the presentation uh, this has been given at some engineering firms over the past two years. So please sure ma please make sure that you're not uh, double counting the PE credits. That wraps it up for the announcement. I'd like to introduce Jim Cannon of FlowServe Limitork as the presenter. I uh, appreciate everybody coming and enjoy the seminar. Jim, it's all yours. Thank you, Jerry. I appreciate everyone joining us this afternoon. So today we're gonna to talk a little bit about valve automation, and walk through some different steps. And All right, give me a second here. Having trouble getting my presentation to move along. Right, here we go. Sorry about that, folks. Okay, um, can everyone see my screen? Yeah, I can see it. I think everybody can see it, Jim. I think you're good. All right, sounds good. All right, so why would we want to plant valves? Um, we're going to go through a couple of these reasons uh, increasing the safety, lack of accessibility, you know, improve operational efficiency, improve process control, and then also more recently, people are getting into uh, preventative maintenance plans. Uh, and, having some technical difficulties again. Is it del it's Jim? It looks like it's delaying moving slide to slide. It is. Yeah. All right. Sit tight, everybody. Give us a minute. We did a dry run just a couple of minutes ago, and it was working just fine. So just just bear with us. Sherry, any thoughts on how to help? Jim, quick. Um... Okay, click into the presentation, but more over on the left side, because you might be clicking okay. in where the dashboard is. Yep, there you go. Okay. Looking good now. All right, so the first reason, increasing safety. Uh, you know, plant personnel, obviously, we are around a lot of uh, different environments, uh, hazardous environments, 
So if we can automate those valves, you know, we can alleviate personnel from actually going out to the valves and being exposed. Ergonomics, physical location of the valves. Uh, we could have valves uh, that are out of reach, um, the strength required to operate a valve uh, also puts people, you know, within a uh, requirement that they've got to be able to physically operate those valves. Uh, from a process-related uh, item, it might be a process shutdown, real quick shutdown if the process is upset. Um, a lot of these electric actuators now have the function for an emergency shutdown where one button could shut down a whole filter or system. And then some of the valves, which may not be used all that frequently, but might be required in an emergency to operate, uh, you could program in what's called a partial stroke test where they might open 5% and then close down, and you could program that in uh, once a month. So lack of accessibility, kind of touched on that, but a lot of these valves are in, in vaults. They're out of reach in piping. They might be uh, overhanging tanks. Uh, for operators and technicians to operate these manually, they're putting themselves in awkward positions. Um, trying to re reach for a hand wheel, a lever. So from a uh, lack of accessibility, automating the valves makes a lot of sense as well. Improving operational efficiency. Uh, a lot of plants, the larger you get, the more valves you have, and you need technicians to go out and sequence, operate the valves. Um, the frequency of operation is, as well you know, uh, can put constraints on, on your personnel. And then getting back to just physically operating the valves, uh, some sluice gate valves, you might have 500 turns to be able to operate that valve. And, you know, you might need 100 or 80 foot pounds or pounds of uh, force on that, that hand wheel. So uh, automating the valves makes a lot of sense for plants. Process control. Uh, obviously, every plant now has some type of SCADA system. Um, you are sequencing these valves. The accuracy, uh, the programming, uh, speed of correction, you know, you are getting precise con control of your process. So when you're able to automate these valves, all that comes together seamlessly. Not to mention, a lot of plants now aren't operated or maintained um, with personnel for a 24 hour period. So you can remotely monitor your valves and your process uh, if you do automate your valves. So last, preventative maintenance. Um, in an era where a lot of equipment now has uh, controllers, uh, computers on board, these actuators can tell you a lot more about your valves than what we were able to get out in the past. So everything from fault alarms, you know, motor hours, uh, drive sleep turns, torque profiling, uh, contactor ops, meaning the number of, of cycles that goes one way or the other, and then just plain data loggers can really allow uh, for plants to fine tune their predictive maintenance and maintenance schedules. So historically, there's really three ways to operate it via valve. I mean, you either have just a manual valve with a, a hand wheel or, or a lever. Uh, you can add a gear operator, which will give you some mechanical efficiency. Those gear operators are, are typically bevel spur or, or worm gear, depending on whether it is a multi-turn like gate valve or quarter turn like butterfly. Most actuators, in municipal plants are electric, but you also occasionally see pneumatic and hydraulic. We're gonna concentrate on electric actuators here since that's the most prevalent type of actuator uh, being installed in municipal plants. So I mentioned gearbox real quickly. So gearboxes are important because, you know, not only can you automate a valve with a gearbox, it will help you reduce um, the effort required to operate that valve because of the mechanical advantage. So a typical worm gear might be a quarter turn, uh, 
20 to 35 percent efficient, those warm gear boxes could give you a mechanical advantage of anywhere between, you know, 25 to 350 to one. So it can drastically uh, improve the efficiency. The bevel gears, the multi-turn sluice slide gates, uh, much more efficient, 90 to 95 percent but their mechanical advantage is usually much lower, maybe in the three to, to 6% range. Uh, spur gears will just can be added between the worms and bevels just as an additional uh, amount of mechanical advantage. And the great thing about these gearboxes is, is you can also then mount an electric actuator to these gearboxes to not only gain the mechanical advantage of the gearbox, but then to automate it completely. So this is just an exploded view of a multi-turn bevel gearbox. And I can highlight, uh, essentially you have the bevel pinion with the bevel gear, which then drives your drive sleeve and um, you are typically automating multi-turn loose and slide gates with this type of gear. Quarter turn worm gear. Uh, so this is mainly for your balls, plugs, and butterfly valves. Uh, this one here is being shown with the um, optional spur gear. And you have your travel stops for end of travel quarter turn. And again, these types of uh, gears can also be coupled up with electric actuators to gain your mechanical advantage. Right, so I think I'm going to stop using the spotlight because that seems to be causing me some issues. So that brings us to poll question number one. Poll question number one. Why would a plant consider automating their manual valves? We'll give you 20, 30 seconds to answer. Why would a plan considering automating their manual valves? E, all of the above. Increase safety, lack of valve accessibility, improve operational efficiency, improve process control, and E, all, or I'm sorry, E, all of the above. Good, it's 100%. Um, Jim, I think we'll kick it back to you. Okay. All right, so we're gonna jump into electric actuator basics here. Uh, we're gonna cover the evolution of electric actuators, uh, two basic designs, one being the electromechanical design, the other being a digital non-intrusive design, some basic network and control options, and then we're gonna get into the basics of, of selecting and sizing electric actuators. If you do have manual valves or going that route, what kind of information would be required? So evolution of electronic actuators, uh, it was probably in about the 1920s that a company came up with a torque limiting design. Um, since then, there were all these other innovations, including modulating actuators, network actuators, adding electronics into actuators. At the end of the day, Electric actuator has been in use for a real long time. So this is one example of an actuator that's located in New Jersey that's been in operation for over 80 years. So I show you this just to show how long actuators have actually been out in service in the plants. 
This actuator here uh, installed back in 1941 was pulled out in, in 2012 and provided over 70 year, years of service. So they come in all sizes and shapes. I show you this here. It's on the 96 inch gate valve for NASA. So you can see, uh, I mean, actuators can get quite large and operate uh, quite very big, very big valves. This actuator here, we're actually showing the gear that's still on the uh, Pratt butterfly valve. This, this valve was actually at ground zero holding back um, Hudson River water from uh, the Twin Towers cooling system. Uh, it was dug up at, after uh, after the uh, disaster at, at Ground Zero, and though the actuator was was broken off, as you can see by the exposed gearing um, on the gear, uh, the technicians were able to manually close this valve to isolate Ground Zero as to not flood it with Hudson River water. And this is actually on display if anyone goes to New York City and visits the 9-11 Memorial. This last one I show you uh, is on a very large uh, uh, aqueduct. It has an eight inch valve stem on a huge gate valve. So most of the valves in your plant will be you know, smaller butterflies, uh, sluice gates, plug valves, but uh, actuators on these very large valves happen all the time. So the basics of the electromechanical design is you have a motor pinion to the left. So you'll have a motor running at 18, 3600 RPM, and it will drive that motor pinion. Off of that motor pinion, you have a geared set of limit switches, which is down to the bottom left. That's gonna give you your position feedback. It's gonna stop the actuator at, at end of um, the valve stroke, all right? Just to the right of that is your torque switch. So that is gonna sense in any over torque uh, uh, situation where maybe you have a sluice gate, uh, something gets under, you're trying to close, the limit switch doesn't make, which would typically shut off the motor uh, to protect the gate. And, but it doesn't close, doesn't reach that end of travel. Well, the torque switch will actually then sense that and open a set of contacts, uh, shutting off the motor so no further damage. If everything's running perfectly, uh, that motor pinion is driven by the motor, uh, the two-piece uh, worm gear, worm shaft transmits the, uh, the force uh, to the drive sleeve and the valve is operating perfectly. So options for seeding a valve. Typically in, in the municipal world, it's always position seeding, all right? So the motor's traveling, it's gonna go X number of amount of turns. The limit switch that I just showed you is gonna uh, op open a set of contacts and it's gonna provide indication back to the motor that, hey, we've reached end of travel, we need to stop producing torque, all right? So in the municipal plants, I mean, we're using balls, butterfly plugs, sluice and slide gates, they are always position seated. Uh, electric actuators are also used in other applications like power plants, refineries, where they're using metal seated uh, valves, uh, metal seated wedge gates, so in these applications, you know, we would, we would torque seat. We would only use the limit switch assembly to give you open and close indication. We would actually run that valve down till the torque switch opened and shut off the power to the motor. So again, in the municipal world, we are only position seating. That brings us to poll question number two. Number two, which types of valves would use position seating technology, i.e. stop end of travel on limits? Give you a couple more seconds. And yeah. 
Got about 80% voted. A couple seconds. Answer is E, all of the above. Ball valve, butterfly valve, plug valve, slide, sluice gate valve. I'm sorry, and slide, sluice gate valve. And Jim, we'll turn it back over. All right, somewhat of a layup question, but so moving forward, uh, I showed you the schematic of just the motor pinion, the limit switch, um, but here is what it would look like in an electromechanical style actuator. So I say electromechanical because in these style actuators, there's typically no electronics, there's no digital boards, there's nothing to go obsolete. Um, this specific actuator I am showing you has a typical 50 year life cycle. Um, you know, when you do not have electronics in your actuators, uh, you know, you tend to have a, a longer longevity and life cycle of the actuator. So real quick here, you know, up to the upper hand left, you can see the motor, uh, that worm shaft right smack in the middle, driving somewhat of a, a golden bronze drive sleeve. And then in the middle of the actuator would be your, just say sluice gate uh, stem, threaded stem. Uh, down in the box to the left-hand side of the box is, is that limit switch assembly. And to the right-hand side of the box behind the push buttons and um, red and green indicator lights for open and close is your uh, torque switch. So very simple design, um, does not go out of date. Uh, been tried and, and proven for decades and decades. So the quarter turn version of this looks pretty similar. Uh, the motor is in the kind of front left hand side. It's the black uh, motor there. It's hooked up to a set of gearing. This has a quarter turn gear set, worm gear set already uh, embedded in it. You have your, your different limit switch and torque switches obviously for your control um, and this would be specifically for a butterfly plug or, or, or ball valve. So these are examples of electromechanical style actuators. These actuators typically have in, inside the control boxes of the actuator themselves, they have what's called basic inter integral control. So they have your, they have your transformer, um, your reversing contactor, uh, your terminal strip heaters, fuses, it, it's all you have to do is bring in your, your power supply and then your discrete control. And if you were going to position with it, then there are, uh, we can add in a modulating feature for a 4 to 20 control and 4 to 20 control out. Now, over the last 20 years, a lot of actuators and process equipment now is becoming uh, digital based. So, and there's a reason for that. We can get so much more information is available to us to make decisions, uh, whether it be for preventative maintenance or precise process control. So digital actuators offer uh, a lot more than their older brethren electromechanical, you know, but uh, when you do add electronics into your actuators, you know, there is a chance that some of those electronics will become obsolete uh, before, say, the gearing wears out or the motor wears out. So an overview of a typical digital electric actuator, uh, it's actually kind of simplified. You don't have the the large torque switch, the limit switch, you're doing things electronically. So to the left-hand side of the actuator, you have a three-phase or you could have a single-phase motor. It direct drives a worm, which then engages the drive sleeve, which if you look into it to the middle, it would be the gold uh, drive sleeve. Your valve stem would come right up through the actuator. If we were gonna couple this with a gearbox, like a bevel gear, then this actuator would actually drive the bevel gear and then the bevel gear would accept the shaft of the um, 
sluice or slide gate. Uh, we could also couple this to a worm gear box, and then the worm gear box would accept the shaft to the quarter turn ball, butterfly, or plug. So within some of the positives or, or uh, of this style actuator is uh, we seal this with O-rings, so it is a uh, double sealed terminal chamber. If you do have some condensation or leakage through a conduit line, it will get into the terminal block, but will not get back into the actuator where the electronics are held. Um, so as typical, this actuator is rated IP68 for temporary submersion of 15 meters for 96 hours. An electromechanical actuator might be one meter for 20 hours, just as a comparison. Um, a couple other things that are happening in this actuator is the user interface is, is simplified. So, so with the information available, now you have an LCD screen that will give you status, uh, faults. You have two selector switches, which are non-penetrating, all effect. Um, and you have very flexible controls. Not only can you hardwire this, discrete wire it, or use a four to 20 in and out, but you could also use a two wire bus such as Modbus, Profi bus device now. So it's very, very flexible because of the use of the electronics in the actuator. This is uh, the quarter turn version. Right, specifically for balls, plugs, and butterfly valves. You know, very similar. We again, we are sensing uh, torque electronically. We are sensing position electronically. The uh, user interface is very sim similar with the LCD screen and the two selector switches. So I will get into that a little further, which sends us to poll question three. Full question three, electric actuators are mechanical machines consisting of an electric motor coupled to gearing that ultimately produce what? I am gonna give you a hint. We don't wanna see anybody answer cosmic energy. More seconds. Now we got 90% voted. Okay. The answer is B, torque. 96% got it correct. Very good. Jim, back to you. All right. Thank you, Jerry. All right, trying to move on here. And hit on the left side um, of your presentation, and then you should be able to move on from that. Yep. I am in stuck mode right now. There we go. All right, sorry about that, folks. Uh, all right, so moving on, let me make sure I am in the right, here I am. So digital actuator operation. I mentioned briefly about the LCD screen and the two selector switches. Uh, it really makes life a lot easier because the information that you need is now present in the LCD. So the selector switches, one of them being the black selector switch, is for opening and closing the actuator, but also when you are programming it, uh, answering yes and no to the uh, commissioning questions that will come up on the LCD screen. The red selector switch allows you to put it in remote so that your control room skater uh, can control the actuator, put it in stop so you have it offline, or you can put it in local so then you can use the black selector switch 
and open and close or move to mid position your actuator. Um, you also have LED indicators. So you have a red indicator, which in the municipal world uh, tends to indicate that the valve is going open. When it's blinking red, it's going open. When it's solid red, it is open. The green will be going, blinking will be going closed. Solid green, it is closed. Those are reversible in the, in the setup mode, if you wish. The yellow in, uh, LED is your monitor relay. That's your all-inclusive fault. If the actuator is either left in stop or local or some other uh, parameters are met, the actuator will not be available for the control room to operate. So the yellow LED will blink. We do also have uh, Bluetooth capability with the actuator. Uh, if you have that option on the actuator, you would also have a blue LED. Um, software updates and, and diagnostic downloads can be done either through the Bluetooth if you have it or as standard through an infrared channel. Uh, the LCD, 32 character graphics, and the not only is the, are the um, selector switches padlockable, but you can also program in a password for the commissioning and setup so no one can change settings. So you, typically you would walk up to the actuator and it's gonna give you the actual valve position and the status. So if all is good, you're gonna get a status of 0% open or 100% and status okay. If you have a fault, and this is where the digital actuators can provide you additional information, you would have where it is, 73% open, and it went to over torque, it's not moving any further. So that would also trigger uh, a fault, and the control room would know that that actuator either A, didn't make end of travel because they're uh, monitoring when it's completely open, completely closed, or they, you could also monitor the over torque function or add it to the monitor relay, which is an all-inclusive fault. So digital style non-intrusives, I've touched on this uh, briefly, but again, because we have electronics in these actuators, we have to take extra precautions to make sure we are protecting that from the environment. Um, so the selector switches, again, uh, they are not through penetrating, double sealed terminal chamber, powder coated, um, you know, we consider this style actuator, it's a buzzword that you might hear from, from engineers or, or actuator and valve guys, but non-intrusive. So non-intrusive just really means that all the commissioning setup can be done through uh, the use of the LCD, selective switch, switches, push buttons, or a handheld device. You do not have to actually open up the actuator once you've terminated your wires in the terminal chamber. You don't have to open your actuator exposing any of the internals to, to the environment to physically set a limit switch or physically set a, a torque switch. So when you hear the word non-intrusive, that's essentially what we're talking about. Um, so digital non-intrusive actuators Again, instead of using that larger uh, rotary limit switch assembly that I showed in the electromechanical design, we're sensing torque electronically. So lots of different ways to do things electronically. Once you introduce uh, electronics into, into any device, you can do it a million different ways, all right? We, we like the use and we've had this patented uh, since 1999 when our style actuator came out, but it uses, uh, it uses optical sensors and optical emitters. We have redundancy at every point. So the, the small black uh, portion in between the two green plates where you have your optical sensors and optical emitters are just uh, small little wheels interconnected to each other with slots and holes. And all it's meant to do is when the optical sensors shine up through that, it emits a specific pattern. That pattern is read uh, by the main board in the actuator, and it knows where that is 
in any point over 10,000 drive slew rotations. And that's true whether there is uh, power to this actuator or not, which is very important because if you lose power to your actuator um, and someone needs to go to it, declutch it, manually override it to open a valve or close a valve, when power comes back on and those optical sensors and emitters stop working, it's going to see that it was driven to a new position and immediately recognize it. There will be no need to uh, reset limits or recommission uh, the actuator because power was lost to the actuator. This just gives you a little bit of a visual. And again, we have uh, in our design, uh, we have redundant emitters and sensors in case one does go down at any point in, um, in our optical encoder. So torque sensing is also done differently in the digital style non-intrusive actuator. Instead of having that physical torque switch, which senses the movement of that two-piece worm, if there is an obstruction, uh, we're sensing torque based on speed, voltage, and, and temperature. And it can be adjusted anywhere between 40% to 100% of the output of, that, uh, of the actuator. Each actuator is sized differently uh, based on the motor horsepower and, and the gearing. So that amount of torque output is actuator dependent. And sensing torque electronically, uh, the main benefit of that is, is essentially no moving parts to wear or break. So one of the biggest differences here in a digital style actuator is the lack of it, the physical limit switch itself, all right? The physical limit switch, you know, does have, the, does have the contacts in the electromechanical design, will give you that end of travel or any mid travel, but that's about it. So now instead of limit switches, we have what's, what's called status contact. And in those status contacts, you typically get four, but you could get up to eight. They could be programmed for any one of these 24 functions. Now, of course, the first two are almost always programmed for to give the uh, control room, you know, end of travel indication, so open and close. But we could also program one commonly is remote selected. Someone walks up and takes that actuator offline by putting the selector switch and stop or local. Uh, the control room will immediately get a fault. Uh, that status contact will indicate that someone had done that. These can be programmed either normally open or normally closed, just depending on um, your own system. So very, very, uh, very functional, very flexible, and very easy to program. Now, I said you could have up to eight of those status contacts, but keep in mind, for every piece of information, every status contact you want to program and bring back, so if I'll go back briefly, if you wanted, we want to know when the valve actually starts moving. We want to know if there's an over torque uh, situation. We also want to know if there's, um, if it's in remote, if the remote selected, it's two wires that every one of those status contacts, it has to be run through the conduits all the way back to the control room to give you that information. So instead, uh, a, a real good way to do this, to get an all-inclusive fault, is it's called the monitor relay. So this is tripped by either loss of our internal uh, transformer for our control power, if we have a jammed valve situation, if the selector switch is in left in, in either local or stop and not in remote, uh, we have a loss of phase of power, motor over temp. We can also configure a couple others being uh, over torque, but this now, you have two wires running all the way back. And if it trips, the control room is going to know that that actuator is not available um, to move. It won't know why. So you're going to have to visit the actuator, which you would have to do anyway to troubleshoot it. But on the LCD screen, will tell you exactly why that monitor relay tripped. So it's a jammed valve. It's a lost in phase. So 
this is a really good solution as to trying to keep uh, the number of uh, wires in your conduits to a minimum, but, but get the necessary information back to your control rooms. So we can still, as in the older electromechanical, you know, provide a full four to 20 in for modulating service and a four to 20 out. Uh, so you know exactly where your actuator is in stroke. So we can modulate, that's not a problem. Um, some other features of digital actuators is because again, we're using a computer on board, we can actually, uh, we can actually auto phase correct. So if, if the electricians come in and, and reverse the legs of, of the wiring, we actually program into the actuator that, hey, counterclockwise is going to be open, clockwise is going to be closed. Doesn't matter how the electricians wire this, it's going to know, the actuator knows that's how it's going to operate. Um, vamp, jammed valve protection, where if it cannot reach end of travel, it will do a brief reverse and forward movement. Hopefully, if something's in the seat, it can flush it down the line, dislodge it. Two speed timers so we can adjust uh, the stroke. We can always slow an actuator down. We can't speed it up. It, that's a function of the motor RPM and, and the set of gearing. Um, and then just some other options as well. So this brings us to flexibility of the connection method. I've already mentioned a few times that most plants are just discrete hardwired. We're bringing in three, four wires typically to the actuator. Um, we're sending in power. We're moving the actuator from open to close. Pretty simple. Four to 20 is still prevalent in a lot of a lot of plants if you're modulating, trying to control. But in addition, what's becoming more popular, especially in, in grassroots or um, rehab of plants, is adding a digital network. And the benefits of the digital network are all that information I showed you for those status contacts, the 24 pieces of information, every one of those pieces of information is available um, over that two wire network, uh, including operation and control of your actuator. So now you're running two wires from one actuator to another, uh, daisy chaining them back to your control room. So you're controlling it on the two wires, you're getting all your status and diagnostic information back over your two wires. So it really simplifies uh, your, your wiring and maximizes the amount of information available from your actuators as opposed to the um, legacy of hard wiring each actuator back to the control room. So some of the network options, for the most part, we see plants using Modbus. It's, it's one of the oldest and uh, most recognized, but within uh, the last few years, we're seeing a hard device net, Profi bus. So for us, um, Actuator guys, whatever you decide is going to be your platform is fine by us. We just add a card that will speak that communication protocol and away we go. So as a overview of old school, I call it old school, uh, new school, old school being the electromechanical, new school being the digital. So the advantages of old school, you know, a lot of technicians really are uncomfortable working on, um, you know, digital, digital style uh, equipment. So they like to actually see the limit switch contact flip. Uh, they like to be able to put a multimeter in there and see if they're getting power. Uh, so it's a lot easier for them to repair lower tech. Also, as an electromechanical, you're definitely less susceptible to voltage spikes, uh, lightning strikes. Um, extremely dependable, longevity of design, and just the total cost of ownership of over time of an electromechanical actuator uh, speaks for itself. On the flip side, the advantages of the digital, uh, the quick non-intrusive setup. I can go and commission uh, 10 digital style actuators in the time it would take me to commission one electromechanical style. Uh, you have the data logger and diagnostics available in digitals, programmable status contacts for, for more information back to the control room. 
uh, multiple control modes, as we just spoke about. The digital style actuators are sealed to a, a much higher level uh, of um, uh, partial submersibility and water ingress. And you can do things such as a partial stroke test, uh, program that in for valves that might not operate, but once every five years to make sure they will operate when available. The disadvantages, electromechanical, the initial cost is typically higher. Uh, it costs a lot more to make that physical limit switch and the physical tour switch um, than to go ahead and uh, get that information out of life from a digital action. Uh, network options to get a little more expensive because you're at, now you're adding digital components into an older electromechanical design. Um, so by that sake, typically there's no data logger. Um, the IP68 rating is uh, a lot lower. I think earlier I said one meter for 20 hours. Uh, typically most of ours are more three meters for 48. And then every time you're gonna add an additional function to an electromechanical design, whether it be you wanna modulate or inhibit relay, you know, you're adding in additional components that are already in there, right? The digital actuator disadvantages are plain and simple, electronics go obsolete. Uh, time marches on and, and we can only get our vendors to continue to make certain boards and so forth for so long. So, you tend to need to do a complete electronic updates occasionally. Uh, training is needed for repair. Definitely more susceptible to voltage and lightning strikes because you have digital uh, components within the actuator. And really the bottom line is the spe specification becomes much more complicated. Um, once you go to a digital actuator, all of the vendors do things differently. And so the specification becomes you know, trying to make it a neutral spec becomes much more difficult with, with a digital actuator. So that brings us to poll question four. Number, number four, pick the best three advantages of non-intrusive digital electric actuators over intrusive electrical mechanical, electromechanical electric actuators. So pick three of the five. We'll give this one a little more time. Only 62% of voted. We'll give it another 20 seconds or so. All right, we're up to 90%. Okay. So the correct answers are A, quick field commissioning and setup, C, data logger and diagnostic features, and E, programmable status contacts can provide alarm faults, which is pretty good. 82%, 82, and 84%. Nice job. Jim, back to you. Back to me. Thanks, Jerry. All right, so at this point, we have considered uh, why we might automate your plant valves. Uh, we have talked about the two common electric actuator designs, and we've also reviewed the most common control. So now let's get into the valves themselves and what it would take to automate. So common types of valves in these plants, multi-turn, quarter turn, all right? Uh, functions of the valves, process isolation, process th throttling. Now here I make a uh, designation 
move to position, you know, is different from really modulating service or process control. So move to position to a mid stroke position. Then we have process control, which would be modulating service for precise process control. All right, that would operate off some process controller, a parameter, level, pressure, temperature, flow. All right. So multi-turn, typically we're looking at cast iron gates, fabricated gates in your plant. You can also be looking at diaphragm pinch or just regular uh, water isolation gates. So the characteristics of these types of uh, valves are um, the travel varies depending on the valve size and type. Okay, so you could have a, a six inch gate valve or a six foot uh, sluice gate valve. You have linear movement of the stems uh, and or the disc plug gate. There is a thrust component. So we do have to add what we call a thrust base somewhere in the actuator design, whether that be the gear itself, if we're coupling to a gear, a bevel gear, or a thrust base to our actuator from top mount. Okay, the stem is typically threaded, keyed, uh, and this is the information we would need. So if you're considering automating an existing multi-turn valve, we're gonna need to know what that valve torque is. So we're gonna to need to know what the breakout start torque and then a mid mid uh, stroke run torque is. So the valve OEM can usually help you with that information. Uh, thrust, not as important because we can determine thrust from the stem diameter pitch. All right, so we will need to know the stem diameter. Not every actuator is capable of accepting uh, every stem diameter. We're going to need to know the thread, and, uh, the pitch in the lead, the stroke flank, what you would like for an operational speed. Typically, it's about 12 inches per minute for uh, sluice and slot gates. You're going to have to give us what your power supply is and how you want to control this. Will this just be hardwired on and off? Is it going to be modulating 4 to 20? Uh, do you have a two-wire digital now? So once we have all that information, it makes it pretty easy for us. So for this example, um, we're talking about a top mount. That means there's no additional uh, gear to give you mechanical advantage. That actuator sits right on top of your valve. The stem goes through the actuator. So in this scenario, you typically have somewhat of a smaller dimensional footprint, right? It typically requires a larger, more costly actuator because all of the torque that you are producing has to be done by the actuator itself. There's, there's no additional gearbox to add some mechanical advantage, right? We do have to add a thrust base uh, to the actuator, to this multi-turn actuator, to take the thrust component, all right? So you may consider this where you have a space uh, constraint. You're in a vault, you don't have side to side. So the top mounted um, footprint works for you. So in this scenario, I just threw out um, this specific actuator I have chosen can put out 18 RPM, 440 foot-pounds of torque, might be a list price of $7,200. Now, if I have the additional side to side and I could side mount where I can add an, a gear to the actuator, it's gonna help me reduce my cost for this scenario because I add mechanical advantage of the gear, now my actuator actually gets smaller. Um, the gear now will take the thrust load. I don't have to add a, a thrust base to the actuator. It's essentially torque only at the actuator because I'm turning the stem of the bevel gear. Uh, we're typically going to operate a little slower in this scenario because we have to overcome the gear ratio of the gearbox itself in addition. So in this scenario here, I have a multi-turn electric actuator producing 52 RPM instead of the 18 RPM uses 125 foot-pounds instead of that 440 for the top mount. 
But when I add in the bevel gear, which is a ratio of 3.5 to 1 with the efficiency, that combination gives me 15 RPM as compared to the 18 RPM top mounted and 411 foot pounds of torque as compared to the 440 and reduces the price from 7,200 to 6,100. So I show this so that you guys see uh, the benefits of being able to side mount uh, and add that, get, gain that advantage, uh, mechanical advantage of adding a gear along with the electric actuator. If we're looking at quarter turn, your typical valves are balls, plugs, butterflies, 90 degree rotation, um, there's no, no thrust component at all, torque only. All right, so in this, it, we actually simplify it quite a bit. So for a quarter turn valve, typically we just really need the brake torque. Um, the run or hydrodynamic torque it only comes into effect on certain butterfly valves, which might be handling um, higher flow rates, higher velocities. Uh, but 95% of the time we can size a, a, an actuator with just the brake torque provided. We do need the stem diameter. Uh, what you would like for a complete cycle operating time. So it might be 30 seconds or 15 seconds for real small quarter turn valves and maybe up to a minute for larger ones so you don't get water hammer. We do need the power supply. And then again, you know, how do you want to control the actuator? So in this scenario, um, top mounted makes a little more sense because we have specific actuators. If the valve's small enough, we can use our, our electric actuator that already has that quarter turn worm gear incorporated into the actuator. So for here, um, we have a quarter turn actuator. This is gonna put out, we're just gonna say 1500 foot pounds, uh, 60 seconds. So we could slow that down if we wanted to. Uh, list price might be just under $5,000 and it's about 80. 80 pounds. If the valve got too big and it got out of the range of these quarter turn style actuators, then we might have to go to a multi turn with the gearbox. But instead of that bevel gearbox, we're looking at a worm gearbox. All right. So here the, the package gets much bigger. And this is, I chose this scenario here because it's right on the cusp at at the upper range of our, our all-inclusive top-mounted quarter turn act, electric actuator where you've got to go to the multi-turn with the worm gear. So you got 26 RPM, 125 foot-pounds. The worm gear gives you a 52 to 1 ratio. It's 31% efficient. And that can produce 2,015 foot-pounds as opposed to the 1,500. Uh, your time is locked in here at 30 seconds, and you're a little more expensive on this one, 57.95. But you are producing more torque, and you can also see the weight, 131 pounds. So you need a bigger footprint. It's going to be a little bigger actuator. You have a little more flexibility when you start marrying uh, the multi turns with the worm gear for larger valves. Brings us to poll question five. All question five. In a side mounted electric actuator configuration, the actuator will drive a gearbox, which in turn will drive the valve. True or false? I always loved these ones back in grade school. I had a 50 50 shot. 50 50. Looks like the 50 is, looks like the right 50 is being answered. And Jim, we do have one or two technical questions. So when you're done, I'll bring those back up, OK? All right, we are just about finished, yeah. Right on time. All right. The answer is true, 91%. That's great. Jim, back to you. All right, so just in review, uh, we talked about the electromechanical versus the digital actuator design. Uh, we also talked about the types of valves that we could be automating. Uh, 
space constra constraints uh, where you might consider a top mount uh, arrangement versus the side mount arrangement. And then what type of information we would need if you were looking to automate a map. So your supply power, your torque, stem diameter, operation speed, et cetera. That concludes uh, the ABEs of valve automation. All right, Jim. So uh, there's a couple quick things. Again, the evaluation certificate of completion, please make sure you fill those out. We'll give a couple extra minutes. So two questions. First question. I hope I, I can, I guess, pose this right. Failure position. Big disadvantage of motor actuator with many of our applications is that it fails in position it is in when the power goes out. For example, when the power goes out, for example. Up to what size motor, if any, can we get spring return for fail open or closed? Okay, so good question. That is uh, probably one of the biggest drawbacks of, of electric actuators. Um, really, springs, adding springs into a, a industrial style electric actuator uh, can really only be done maybe up to about 100 foot-pounds of torque, which doesn't cover too many sizes of valves. So uh, we at Limit Torque uh, are working on some designs, but typically if you absolutely need a fail-safe position, um, you know, we typically recommend an electrohydraulic style uh, actuator, which we do produce. Now, the drawback of that is they're typically five plus times the cost of a standard, you know, electric actuator. Second question, same gentleman. For precise process control that requires a lot of hunting to achieve a small bandwidth, parentheses, lots of changes in position over time, close parentheses, would motor actuator be a good choice? They used to burn out quite quickly, though. I am a uh, uh, quickly, though I am a dinosaur. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> right. So, you know, we in most municipal plants, from what I've seen and I've been uh, with Flowser for 30 years, you know, typically if your actuator is burning out, then you have not set your parameters right. You know, uh, electric actuators aren't designed uh, to hunt and follow a set point. You know, if you have tank level, you should have some type of dead band that gives us, you know, two to three inches as to the tank level it would require. Um, so having the correct dead band in a system is important. Now, having said that, the recent developments in electric actuators, we do have brushless DC motors available in our digital style actuators that can provide pr precise control. So those actuators there with the, with the uh, brushless DC motors and solid state controls can follow a, a, a signal uh, pretty precisely down to 0.1%. But again, we don't really recommend that and don't know of any application in a municipal plant that should require that. All right. Thanks, Jim. No more questions. Um, we're good to go. I'll give everybody another 30 seconds just to finish up the uh, questionnaire, and then we'll uh, go from there. Jim, I appreciate you spending the time to go through this with us and our customers. All right. Thank you, Jerry. Appreciate the opportunity. Okay, I think we're going to sign off now. Um, if you have any questions or you were able, unable to get your certificate or something, please just email me. Thank you. Have a great day and thank you, Jim.